Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on data-driven pathways to wastewater zero. My name is Tom Williams and I am Director for Nature Action and Water at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And hopefully that video has given you a little bit of framing for our session today, which will look at uh, industrial action on wastewater. And I'm really pleased to be bringing you this session today alongside our co-conveners, uh, UN Habitat and CDP. Some quick housekeeping, uh, we will be recording this session so you can come back uh, to the Pathable platform and view it uh, throughout the week. It should be accessible for you. Please use the chat function on Pathable uh, to post any questions as they come to you. I will be coming back to questions uh, a little bit later on during our panel discussion. So do use the Pathable chat functions to post any questions you may have for speakers or panelists. Our agenda for today, uh, we will have three quick uh, presentations to give you some background and context as it relates to industry and wastewater, uh, taking a look at some of the trends, drivers and key priorities moving forward. We will then have a panel discussion that will focus on data and how it can accelerate action on wastewater and also take some of your questions. Here is an overview of our contributors uh, to today's session. Um, we will have Kate Lamb from CDP and Graham Alabaster from UN Habitat, providing a little background and context uh, to wastewater and some corporate tens and some updates on SDG 6.3. We'll then dive into our panel discussion um, where we'll have Luis from ICRA, uh, Matteo from ABB and Nadja from Actium. And I'll also um, uh, take your questions as they come in. And special thanks to our co-hosts for today's session, Swapner and Lauren, who are making sure that we have a smooth transition between all the slides, the videos, and can facilitate your questions. Okay, I'm going to um, provide an overview of WBCSD's Wastewater Zero Initiative, where it came from, uh, its objectives and key activities. And over the last few years, we've gained a much clearer understanding of the scale and urgency of the wastewater challenge and also the role of business from 2017's World Water Development Report, which focused on wastewater and brought to prominence this figure of 80% of wastewater being discharged without treatment. The 2018 status report from UN Water on SDG 6, which has since been updated, but the message remains the same. We are not on track to meet SDG 6 targets. And the World Bank's report from 2019 the invisible water crisis, which for the first time presented a global economic impact of water pollution. And in 2020, a report from WRI put a cost to meeting SDG 6 targets by 2030, and specifically for eliminating industrial wastewater pollution, they estimated an annual cost of 87 billion US dollars uh, up till 2030 which is considerably cheaper than business as usual. And we've continued to have annual water reports from CDP with their data insights from corporate disclosure. And in recent years, it has been uh, highlighting corporate action and blind spots as it relates to water pollution, which we'll hear more about later from Kate. So all of this was the backstory, if you like, of the Wastewater Zero report that was published in 2020, um, where we set out to drive business action on wastewater to contribute to meeting SDG 6.3. To do this, we framed the wastewater challenge as a climate issue, uh, as a biodiversity issue, and as a water security issue. And we make, make the case that fixing the problem is cheaper than a business as usual approach. We have three areas of work to support business action on wastewater, and for each of them, data is absolutely critical. First is the Wastewater Zero Commitment. Uh, I'll provide more details on that in a minute. This is a commitment for business to demonstrate their leadership on eliminating wastewater pollution. Secondly, we are working on a wastewater impact uh, assessment tool. This will effectively enable companies to screen their own facilities and their suppliers to identify priority sites that have the biggest negative impact as it relates to wastewater pollution. And thirdly, we have the wastewater impact protocol. And this is aiming to standardize the way in which companies uh, assess, understand, and report on wastewater impact. 
So the Wastewater Zero commitment, uh, which was launched in June this year, is a business commitment to eliminating wastewater pollution. It has three pillars that business must commit to with targets to meet no later than 2030. Uh, those three pillars are to treat 100% of wastewater and release zero hazardous substances in own operations and with suppliers. The second pillar is to increase the proportion of reused and recycled water again in own operations and in the supply chain. And the third pillar is to ensure that wastewater treatment processes are low carbon and aligned with net zero climate commitments. The reporting for the commitment will be facilitated by the CDP uh, water security questionnaire. So for companies already disclosing through CDP, we'll, we will extract the relevant data submitted to report annually on your progress towards uh, the wastewater zero commitment. So this is not creating a new reporting mechanism for business, but using the tried and tested system from CDP that you will hear about uh, later from Kate. So companies' initial commitments will be related to their own operations, and then depending on how much of the company's wastewater footprint is within its own operations versus suppliers, their supplier commitment is between 12 to 24 months later. So if most of the wastewater footprint is own operations, um, then the supplier commitment comes no later than 12 months. If most of the wastewater footprint is with suppliers, then there is up to 24 months to make the supplier commitment. And this is really recognizing that it takes some time to work with long and, and com complicated supply chains. So to bring these different components together, uh, the Wastewater Zero Commitment is about mobilizing business, getting business to step up and raise their ambition to support SDG 6.3. The Wastewater Impact Protocol is about moving business and other key stakeholders such as investors to adopt a standardized approach to understanding wastewater impacts. So as we move beyond metrics that are purely volumetric and instead start to understand wastewater pollution impacts, as it relates to biodiversity, climate change, and water security. And lastly, the wastewater impact assessment tool is about directing action to where it is most needed to reduce negative impacts. And data is so important across these different components, not just in terms of its availability, but also how it is used and shared across stakeholders for decision-making. I'm really happy that we have CDP and UN Habitat on board as wastewater zero champions, which means we can work together to reach out to key constituencies, industry, investors, and local governments to ensure we can create the right enabling environment for business to step up and take the Wastewater Zero commitment. So with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Kate Lamb, who is the Global Director for Water Security at CDP. Uh, Kate, over to you. Thanks, Tom, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to World Water Week. Very exciting. This is my first presentation of what will no doubt be a very busy week for many of us. I wish we were all in person, um, but hopefully next time, uh, next year, things will be different. So as Tom explained to you, uh, my name is Kate Lamb. I'm the Global Director of Water Security at CDP. I also wear a second hat, which is um, the, um, the water lead for the UNFCCC's High Level Climate Champions. And in both of these, with both of my hats on, we've identified that re-establishing our, our, or rethinking our approach to wastewater management is absolutely a fundamental opportunity, not only to achieve water security and a more resilient future, but also as a vast untapped opportunity to really mitigate GHG emissions. So it encourages many of you as possible to pay close attention to this campaign and sign up and do all that you can. Other drivers, of course, for taking action on this issue is the fact that many financial institutions have woken up to water security issues, whether this is a, a, a severe lack of the resource itself or indeed the pollution potential and the risks and opportunities that face companies as a result of this situation. CDP launched its global water program in 2009. Um, I've been running it for the last decade. And since then, we've seen a real marked increase in the number of institutional investors that are asking CDP to focus on companies and increase the amount of data that they have available to them. When we first started, um, the, 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 the source of information out there, the amount of information, amount of data that investors had access to in order to make more informed decisions about where they put their capital was very, very bleak indeed. 
most companies were not disclosing any information whatsoever, let alone standardized, meaningful information. So we stepped in to fill that gap. Today, the programme operates on behalf of over 510 institutional investors with around $110 trillion worth of assets. That's larger than the economies of the US, the UK, the rest of Europe combined, a very important and significant group of stakeholders, I'm sure you can imagine. Next slide, please. And so, as I say, in 2010, 2009, we decided to step in and fill this data gap that exists to encourage companies to provide meaningful standardized information, both about the way in which they manage freshwater resources across their, their direct operations and their supply chains, but also about the risks and opportunities that they face and how they're taking steps to mitigate and manage these issues. The data spans a whole range of, of, of data points and I'll, I'll cover that in a moment. In the first year of the, pro oh, Back, back one slide, please, Swapna. Um, when we first issued the questionnaire, we had around 150 companies disclosing. Important? Yes. Enough? No. But I'm really encouraged, therefore, to be able to let you know that just last year, we're, we're just getting our numbers in now for 2021. So this presentation focuses on the data that we had for 2020. We invited just over five and a half thousand companies from across a wide range of high impact sectors to disclose this information to their investors through CDP. Um, just under 3,000 responded in 2020. That's, we had a huge jump in the number of responders that year, despite the challenges of COVID, and we're quietly optimistic about a further increase this year. It's safe to say that the disclosure is now normally normalising across a range of geographies and sectors. Next slide, please. And as I said, in addition to how um, the steps the companies are taking to manage freshwater withdrawals and consumption across their organisations, we are also asking companies to disclose wastewater related data, as you can see here. These indicators span across what is at times a fairly complex questionnaire structure. Um, and the structure itself is there to not only gather information and the data that investors need, but to spark important dialogues and fundamental behaviour changes within the companies that are disclosing themselves. So CDP and our institu institutional investors very much see that fundamental to our success, in, important, the, the, the real uh, secret source, if you like, to encouraging companies and ensuring they will meet the targets that they set, is placing wastewater at the heart of business strategies and business decision making. And so you can see that in addition to the perhaps more traditional indicators around the amount of wastewater treated, the amount of wastewater reused and recycled, we also monitor the proportion of CEOs that have their remuneration, their bonuses or their pay indeed tied to the achievement of wastewater commitments and targets. It's by having those strategic high level uh, interventions in place that enhance the ability for the company to succeed in achieving those goals. Next slide, please. And our analysis of that of a, a, a group of responding companies um, suggests that whilst there are a, a number of companies that are beginning to understand this issue, it really pales into significance when you consider the fact that just 10% of responding companies reported pollution as a significant risk to their business. Particularly um, those companies in the mining, power generation, fossil fuels and material sectors are the most aware, but that number is really small overall. Of the 2,400 companies that answered this question, just 232 report that pollution is a risk to their business. Now we know, and you'll hear from Graham, that that very much is not reflecting reality at all. And in fact, this is an issue for all companies that are responding to CDP. So what do we do about that? I mean, ultimately, we believe that the situation may be driven by the false impression that in the, the, this issue is immaterial, you know, that the regulatory fines and penalties that companies are, are facing are really insignificant. They're merely noise on a profit and loss sheet of a multi-billion dollar corporation. But that is, as I say, not the case in many instances. Next slide, please. Our analysis also demonstrates that we've seen a range of responses from companies, most of which could be categorized as, as business as usual pollution management responses. Important? Absolutely. Transformational? Not yet. 
most respondents are focused on managing the risks and impacts associated with the potential to release pollution from their factories. Whilst this is important, it's clearly not the whole story. And in this, this case, the adage of what you measure, what you manage holds true. And encouragingly, our analysis shows that 57% of respondents are monitoring the wastewater that they discharge in some form across the majority of their facilities. However, less than half of the companies are monitoring the actual quality of their discharge. So they might be monitoring the, the volume of water that leaves their sites, but not whether this water is suitable to be going out into the environment, whether it meets mandatory or even exceeds, ideally, mandatory freshwater quality requirements. Companies in the mineral extraction and power generation sector tend to dominate and are doing a fairly good job on this, but of course there's still certainly some way to go. Next slide, please. We took our analysis a few steps further, including to look at to see whether, despite the lack of awareness, companies may still be acting. Here we see that the proportion of companies setting pollution reduction targets is no better, it, it is, is still not a better picture. Target setting plays a vital role in pollution management. Available evidence shows the targets are important elements in the successful execution of corporate strategies. They can lead to both cost and impact reductions, promote innovation and reduce dependency. Yet, when it comes to target setting to avoid pollution, just 12% of all respondents have set a pollution reduction goal and target. Now, as I say, that was in 2020. And I'm hopeful that we'll see a better outcome in 2021. Watch this space for our next global report on this topic. Next slide, please. We're only able to tell this story, of course, and draw attention to the, these issues because of the efforts the companies are taking to provide the data that is requested of them. In addition to publishing the report, which has been downloaded more than 5,000 times, we've shared these insights with over 100 financial an analysts on one-to-one -one calls. We've shared them with 450 companies and with the global client base of both Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse. And as you can see here, we distribute this data widely across a whole range of users, spanning academic institutions, financial regulators, through to civil society, and indeed towards the companies themselves. We do this every year to make sure that those stakeholders are able to play their part in tracking um, accountability and progress. Next slide, please. If we're going to achieve a water secure world, we really do need to rethink our approach to wastewater. We need to consider wastewater not only as a waste, but as a source of energy, heat, water, nutrients, and valuable materials. Several cities, for example, are already taking strides to extract nutrients from municipal wastewater in order to make fertilizer or to use wastewater as a source of energy. These technologies exist to enable industrial users to do exactly the same thing and reap the rewards. We also need to re-establish re our relationship with water and the chemicals that we put into it. For example, a number of companies are now looking to replace hazardous chemicals with less impactful substances that biodegrade much more rapidly and pose a much lower risk to freshwater biodiversity and human health. Some of these solutions can be termed disruptive innovations approaches that challenge or disrupt the usual way of seeing things and indeed of doing business. If these are accepted and effectively scaled, they'll enable us to achieve the water secure future that we all so desperately need. We need to think about water security in the context of the transition to net zero carbon emissions, as Tom has already mentioned. Some solutions that companies are employing are contributing to the twin aims of both achieving water security and net zero emissions. We need to see these scaled rapidly within the next four years in order to succeed. Our final slide, please. So it is time to ratchet our ambition. Data and putting it to good use in ways that inform better decision-making and strengthen accountability is of course vital to this. So I'm here today to encourage those companies, those amongst you that are already dis disclosing to CDP to please continue to do so. For those that have yet to start, my question to you is, what are you waiting for? We can win this race, but we all must run it together. So thank you for giving me the opportunity today, Tom and Swapna. Um, and I really look forward to hearing more of what Graham has to say and the rest of the panelists. Thank you. 
great. Thanks a lot, Kate. And it's it's always fascinating to see the CDP data and, and the collaborations uh, it drives with various stakeholders, such as investors, and great to see CDP giving prominence to corporate action on water quality. As many of you will be aware, SDG 6.3 addresses water quality, and UN Habitat is one of the key um, custodians for SDG 6.3. So I'd like to now hand over to Graham Alabaster, who's head of the Geneva office at UN Habitat, to give uh, a bit of an overview and update to SDG 6.3 and some, I think, very up-to-date information that's possibly being launched today in the report. Graham, am I right? Absolutely, Tom. Yes, absolutely. Over, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. And hello to all of you. It's an absolute pleasure to join this event and to uh, see that we have a good uh, a good following. Um, I, uh, aside from being head of Geneva office, uh, I'm a public health engineer by profession, and uh, I know full well the challenges that the industry have to face to uh, treat water. And uh, we have this magic term, of course, the polluter pays principle, but without having uh, this uh, insight into uh, levels and production of wastewater and understanding who is responsible for pollution, it becomes very difficult. So that's why this monitoring is so radically important. If we could have the next slide, please. So basically 6.3 is a part of uh, SDG 6, which is so-called named the water goal, and it applies to wastewater. The target actually is about all forms of wastewater. And as you know, wastewater comes from domestic uh, sources, industrial, and it's, there's a wide variety of sectors that produce uh, wastewater. And of course, some is discharged into sewers, some goes into the environment. So um, it's actually quite a complex situation of understanding how we, uh, how we develop the methodology to, uh, if you like, tease out the information related to specific parts of, of wastewater. And my colleagues at WHO, Rick, Rick Johnson, who's on, on, on the call now, um, who's been responsible from WHO's side for the domestic wastewater work, uh, has been doing this uh, admirably for, for many, many years as the JMP work. But it's only with the, the current uh, SDG that we've actually broadened the definition to include more on the wastewater. So for the sake of, uh, of this uh, uh, particular meeting, we're focusing on the industrial uh, propo proportion and, you know, the, the indicator states that basically the proportion of wastewater safely treated uh, is in an ideal world what's produced uh, over what's, treat uh, what's treated over what's produced. Now, you know, that's uh, uh, basically not so easy to, uh, to understand and to measure, as I will um, proceed to tell you in the next few slides. Can we have the next slide, please? So in terms of categorizing industry, we already have a standard uh, classification code for industry, which is basically the way that most countries, the countries that report, report their wastewater. This uh, work at the moment is collected mainly by our colleagues in UNSD, who are also a co-custodian on this indicator with WHO and UN Habitat. And as you can see, there's quite a detailed way of expressing how wastewater is produced. Now, this is an ideal world. Most countries don't go to this level of disaggregation, but there is a system in place and we have developed a methodology to do this in more detail. Next slide, please. So uh, we can see here, um, wastewater, of course, is treated in a variety of different ways. Um, there's, uh, you know, it varies from where you are in the world, what the standards are, what the treatment standards are, and of course, uh, how developed the economies are and whether they've invested in wastewater treatment. In vast parts of the world, uh, wastewater, of course, is discharged untreated. Some places it undergoes uh, up to secondary treatment, and in many cases, in advanced economies, we're even seeing tertiary uh, treatment um, in some of the Gulf states where, of course, water is very, very scarce and reuse is a top priority. There's a high level of treatment goes so water can be reused. So a lot of um, the wastewater is treated in wastewater treatment plants. It also goes into um, different independent treatment facilities, and that, in industry's case, may be uh, dedicated treatment works, or it may be systems uh, for pre-treatment, such as sort of similar to septic tanks and others, and then discharged into the environment. Um, the next slide, please. So some of the results that I'm uh, going to present will be, in fact, launched in a major report this afternoon at the Water Week, uh, which um, WHO ourselves and UNSD have put together, which is to give a picture of what's going on. So you're getting some advanced information. So you can see here, if you look at this slide, um, 
there's only a sort of limited number of countries who actually report uh, on wastewater. Um, and, you know, this, if we look at wastewater uh, generated by the so-called domestic, domestic sector um, and services, and this includes sort of things like government buildings, hotels, you can see there that there's huge uh, variability in the uh, wastewater that's generated by different uh, economic activities and of course by different countries. And you can see that uh, this gives you an idea of the level of complexity of what's reported uh, in, in some countries. Next slide, please. So if we look at the amount of total wastewater treated, that's wastewater from all sources that's reported by countries. And when I say reported, this is figures that the countries give through their national statistical offices to uh, UNSD. So these are reported figures, they're not estimates. These are what countries reported. Now, I mean, obviously there's variation in how that, um, that reporting is done, but this basically is what we, we're dealing with. And this is the data that we've got. And for total wastewater, there was only 42 countries that reported uh, uh, this statistic um, at national level. And, you know, if you think about it, that's actually only a very small uh, number of countries. And it only represents uh, about uh, around 20% of the world's population. So the key message in one of the key messages of this report we're going to show this afternoon is that of all the wastewater that's produced in the world, only 20% of the world's population is represented, which is, of course, uh, rather, uh, you know, small. This is all wastewater. Can we have the next slide, please? If we look at the situation with industrial wastewater treated, the situation is even worse. And globally, at this moment, there are only 14 countries who are actually reporting national level data on the proportion of wastewater treated. And that, I'm sad, sorry to say, only represents 4% of the world's population. So we have a huge way to go to get anything like a real picture of what's going on. And, you know, if you actually put those two statistics for total and industrial together, it means that at least 70%, at least 70% of the world's wastewater is not treated, okay? Uh, bearing in mind the countries that have reported are the ones of higher economic development and many regions of the world don't report the situation is going to be worse. So it's at least 70%. That figure of 80%, which uh, we keep hearing, it's probably at least 80%, maybe even more. So the situation is pretty grim and we're not reporting exactly what's going on. Um, as my colleagues uh, in, in WHO uh, have, have done a lot of work on the domestic wastewater, they've got much better estimates of the domestic wastewater that's produced. But sadly, for total and industrial, the figures are still pretty poor. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? What's also very important about wastewater from industry is that although um, the flow rates are monitored, um, we also need to understand the, the polluting ability or the BOD or the amount of organic material or inorganic material that's actually polluting. And I'm showing you this slide here uh, of Mexico, where you can see that if you look at the wastewater treated from municipal and non-municipal. In this situation, municipal is mainly domestic and services wastewater, and non-municipal is industry and everything else. You can see that although the volumes generated and treated uh, are reasonably, well, they're about, you know, equal, as say not equal, but they're of the same order of magnitude. If you actually look at the proportion, the polluting ability of this wastewater, pardon me, you can see that the non-municipal portion in the country like Mexico, which is of course industrialized, um, is extremely high. So in actual fact, even though we're measuring volume and it's very important to measure volume, and currently that's what we're looking at the indicator. If you dig down deeper uh, into to the situation and you look at the polluting ability of wastewater, you know, sometimes you can have a low volume of wastewater, but it can be highly polluting. And this is why the work of Wastewater Zero and what Kate's been doing with CDP is so incredibly important because we need to understand in more detail exactly what that non-domestic wastewater is composed of. And, and you know, it's very difficult to do that. So we, we rely very much on industry uh, to report on that as best they can. Um, and, you know, this would greatly help our efforts to encourage um, countries to report 
more national data to uh, the UNSD database. So could we have the, uh, the next slide? Or is that the last slide? I can't quite remember. Um, okay, this is my last slide. So uh, the only other, uh, oh, can we just go out there? Yeah, that one, I'll be very quick here. But the, the, re the reason I show this slide from Costa Rica is it actually shows, if you consider all sources of wastewater produced in a country like Costa Rica, um, you can see that um, there's, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of, uh, uh, if you like, uh, produced, the proportion of wastewater produced um, is uh, the, 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 the BOD loads actually come from many different sectors. And although, of course, the wastewater and sludge from domestic sources it is an important fraction. It's by no means the largest proportion. You can see that goes to agriculture, livestock, and, and related uh, activities. So um, this, uh, again, shows us a bit more of the jigsaw and helps us to understand. So <clears throat> my message really is, uh, we greatly appreciate industries who can report on uh, the levels of uh, waste volumes and the uh, pollution load of the wastewater that they're discharging. We're more than happy to help as you and Habitat and the other agencies to support you uh, in that process. Um, and uh, we encourage you to uh, contribute your data to this database so as uh, national reporting can be uh, sharpened up and be given a better idea. So we can get to the stage where we can look at the polluter place principle uh, effectively and we can start to understand how really, if you're discharging wastewater, as Kate was saying, it's a resource that's contributing to uh, harm in the environment, to people's health, uh, and of course, to contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much for your attention, everyone. And um, if you want to learn more about the report, you can listen in this afternoon. There's only a small part of, uh, of the, uh, the, the overall meeting devoted to wastewater, but I'm sure uh, myself and my colleagues from WHO uh, Rick Johnson and others will be very happy to uh, to chat with you some more if you if you uh, need any more information. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Graham, and, and thanks also for your continued uh, support and for really, I think, teeing up our discussion, you know, highlighting some of these key areas where data is is necessary to um, pull some of these levers. Um, on Wednesday, WBCSD will be releasing an insight paper that touches on some of the data Graham presented and starts to address how business can respond um, to some of those challenges and collaborate with other key stakeholders, um, which brings us to our panel discussion, where we will be focusing on data and explore the perspectives of various stakeholders. Uh, on our panel, we have a researcher an institutional investor and a business that works um, with industry and municipalities on wastewater management. As a reminder, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat function on the Pathable platform, not in the Zoom chat. And I will um, pick up the questions as we move through the discussion and see if we can get through a few with our panelists. So I'm going to ask our panelists to turn on their videos. Um, and uh, before answering my first question, it'd be great if each of the panelists could just briefly um, introduce themselves, um, their institute, and uh, briefly the work they do. I'm going to start with you, um, Luis. Um, you're with ICRA, uh, the Catalan Institute for Water Research. Um, I briefly introduced the wastewater impact assessment tool earlier, and ICRA is leading the development of this tool. Could you provide some more detail on the tool and, and how it will help inform decision making and how it will help data collection? But as I said, Luis, please introduce yourself and your institution before responding to that question. Yeah, thank you, Tom, uh, for this, uh, for the introduction. So my name is Luis Corominas. I'm a research scientist at the Catalan Institute for Water Research. Um, I am a specialist in uh, wastewater monitoring, modeling, and control. And at ICRA, um, we, we have a research institute with interlinks like uh, we have three departments, one on uh, ecology, one on uh, analytical chemistry and uh, microbiology, and another one on technologies for wastewater treatment. So there's a multidisciplinary uh, environment to develop uh, tools to help um, utilities or decision makers make informed decisions. So we have long experience in developing these decision support tools, which normally now became into simple web-based tools that allow users to get in and, 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 um, and extract useful information. 
So in, in this case, um, we have put together the, the experts, multidisciplinary team in our uh, research institute to uh, give response to, to, get to the need uh, related to the wastewater uh, impact uh, monitoring and assessment for industries. And uh, the WIRE tool, the wastewater impact assessment tool, will help uh, wastewater well, uh, utilities to um, monitor, quantify the impacts related to um, water, uh, water security, uh, biodiversity, and greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, it has a structure, it will work uh, at different layers. So the first layer is on a global context and will help utilities to understand what is the impact of their wastewater at the uh, at the, at the global context uh, using uh, global indicators. So there are layers available um, on water scarcity, flooding risk, uh, population, I mean, the uh, eutrophication risk. So many indicators related to water quantity, uh, quality, and reputational risk for, for um, yeah, the industry. And uh, this helps like uh, understanding where and how um, actions need to be taken by these industries to go towards the zero, uh, zero uh, net, uh, net zero emissions. Great, thank you so much, Luis, and we'll come back to you later. Um, you. And I'm gonna move on now to Matteo from ABB. Um, and Matteo, I could imagine data is super critical to your business model, your relationship with your, your various um, industry partners, municipal partners as well. So as a, as a technology provider in this space, what do you see as the key limitations for adopting digital solutions and how smart solutions for measurement and monitoring wastewater data for industry and municipal plants? What are some of the, the limitations and opportunities that you see? Yeah, thanks, Tom. First of all, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. And uh, really, thanks. I'm really glad to be here and take this opportunity to share in this panel. <clears throat> I would like to say that before answering to your question directly, there is one key element I like to share. It's a little bit of statistic where, uh, in order to give more importance to the topic we are touching today, only 0.007% of the planet water is available for consumption and water application. And this uh, give us a little bit an idea, you know, how important uh, is gonna play the wastewater uh, in, in the coming future. Now, this charging, uh, I have to say that the water treatment is becoming more and more uh, crucial in our approach. And we as a, a technology provider, we would like to support our customer providing the full set of information. Uh, this means that we are able to provide the, the, the automation layer that is increasing importance uh, to secure uh, more real time awareness data and uh, have a proper control of the process. In this uh, control layer, I would like also to understand, uh, I like that hand-to-hand uh, uh, -hand, uh, uh, information, they are definitely crucial when we talk about uh, increasingly intelligent device and instrument that uh, definitely help uh, support to generate this data. Now, coming back to your question, which are the main constraints that we can see today? Actually, I have to say that the digital is offering a, a crucial uh, a huge opportunity for collecting data and actually even understand that the hide the pattern behind this data. I see three major uh, uh, elements I would like to say in terms of potential constraint. First of all, uh, we should not forget that uh, water is a governmental uh, source and this means that in order to fully deploy the data, we need to align uh, the digital investment as well as uh, in line with the digital, uh, I have to say, with investment in the, in the water and wastewater treatment. Now, we all know very well that uh, the, itself, the, 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 the water segment uh, has uh, some financial constraint. So aligning these uh, two elements should help us uh, speed up uh, in a certain way the deployment of the different solution uh, in, the, in the market uh, and then support the di di digitalization. I, there is even another key element that I like to see. There is a, a kind of um, added pressure for the scaling in the, in the different uh, uh, plants, as well as uh, I have to say that the different operators, they are increasing, increasingly rely on uh, intuitive instrumentation. 
to compensate in a certain way the growing knowledge gap that we see. So this means that we, as a technology provider, we need to provide intuitive and low maintenance by design product in order to really reach, uh, reduce uh, in a certain way the um, maximum amount of maintenance for the service. And then the product itself, they should be really accurate and the accuracy in this case is complying on two different elements. From one side, in order to fully respect the regulation, as we know are crucial in our segment, as well as uh, the accuracy is uh, in a certain way producing uh, energy reduction uh, also in the fast lead time or response time that the product they may have. So the combination of these two elements should uh, definitely support and ally to face some of the two constraints that the, the, the current uh, wastewater plant they are facing that we should not forget that they always rely on the fact that we should release uh, quality of the water as well as uh, cost constraint we should take in consideration. So this is really uh, fundamental, I would like to say, because uh, the more we, we get in the having more plants, more uh, instrument, more data, and then uh, all these data, they should definitely bring to some element. And what is important, uh, uh, I would like even to stress that uh, more measurement take was more data, but unless this data are not really converted into actionable insight, it's a limited purpose. So the combination between uh, governmental alignment with digital, as well as uh, bringing some of the uh, topic of the skilling and then uh, bring some intuitive uh, device or instrument that should uh, help and support the, the deployment of the digitalization and consequently even the treatment of the data among the, the, the wastewater uh, uh, plants. I hope I Great, thanks. your yes. question. No, thanks for that, Matteo. Giving us great insight to some of the practicalities of uh, data collection. But as you rightly point out, collecting data is one thing. Being able to use it to inform decisions is is, is quite another. And and we'll come back uh, to you a little bit later on for some further insights. And um, Nadia, turning to to, to you, you know, the urgency to act on wastewater is evident both for uh, industry um, but also investors. So as an investor at Actium. Um, what do you see as the key levers to raise ambition of industry for SDG 6.3? What is the change that investors can create in this space of data as it relates to wastewater and, and really help business, business make that commitment to wastewater zero? Um, so Nadja, maybe you can first introduce Actium before um, getting into the response. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, glad to see you joining the session. Um, so I'm Nadja Franse. I work in the uh, sustainability and strategy team of Actium. Actium is a Dutch institutional investor and um, we are um, investing in a responsible way. So we have several uh, drivers that we focus on and uh, water is one of them. Other drivers are, for example, climate change, biodiversity, other drivers. Um, but yeah, water is one of them. And then we focus both on water uh, quantity as well as water quality. Um, and coming back to your question, Tom, I think um, the first thing that investors should do is uh, formulate for themselves an ambition on, uh, on water use in general, but also on, uh, on water pollution. Um, at Actium, for example, we have set an ambition of water neutrality in our uh, investment portfolio by 2030. And we are currently looking how we can uh, translate this ambition even better uh, to have eventually zero water pollution. I think for investors, this could already help um, focus, set your ambition, create commitment throughout the company and yeah, commit resources to this topic. Um, and then with regards to companies, what you then can do is um, one of the most powerful tools, I think, uh, is to conduct engagement with companies, to really start dialogue with companies on these topics. And of course, uh, it might be difficult, as we already said, it's, there is currently a lack of data. So you don't exactly know what uh, the impact of several companies in your portfolio are on water pollution, how their discharges actually impact a catchment um, but maybe then initially uh, the 
first focus of engagement could be more process oriented. Um, also, the wastewater zero commitment will help in this. You could ask companies like, did you do a risk assessment? Do you monitor your water discharges? Um, do you monitor and potentially replace hazardous substances used in your production process? Um, do you commit to uh, water reuse, water recycling, etc.? So this uh, can all help uh, companies in ra uh, raising awareness with companies and uh, reducing at least the most hazardous uh, part of their discharges. So I think as investors, you are in the ideal position to, to create this pressure on companies. Um, and then, of course, um, by doing this, you should also, I think, acknowledge that for companies, it might be difficult as well, because of course, they also don't have all the data. There are not a lot of technologies yet that, that help companies in doing that. They are being developed more and more, but they are not always in place yet. Um, so what would help in this engagement is uh, not only focusing on the lagging companies and saying they have to do better, but also uh, within such engagement include uh, leading companies, other knowledgeable NGOs, for example, in order to see what their struggles were and how they have solved uh, such struggles. And then as an investor, you can collect all this information and then eventually also uh, share this information with the companies that still have uh, have a further road to go and and really help them yeah learn create a collective learning experience actually between lagging leading companies ngos investors etc fantastic thanks so much um nadia so we, we've heard about um the collaboration between researchers utilities and industry um from luis and how that's developing tools to inform decision making and from mateo um some of the practical realities of adopting technologies to collect and analyze data and the cost constraints and the need to ensure that the right data is used to inform the right decision and from nadia and you know, the investors perspective is to form an ambition engage and start a dialogue with companies and not just to focus on the laggards, but also leading companies and other key stakeholders so we can learn from those experiences. I want to turn back um, to each of our panelists with, um, with one last question for them to consider. And they've all um, started to touch on this, but from your, um, your, your perspective, so as a researcher, an investor or a technology provider, what would you say is the most critical area of collaboration with industry um, that your particular constituency should be driving around wastewater and data? What would you like to see us move quickest on? Where would you like us to see our, put our energy as it relates to your um, particular collaboration with industry? So, Luis, I'll, I'll start with you. You're on mute, uh, Luis. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, probably the the bottleneck is is the engagement that Nadia was talking about. So, uh, like uh, engaging with industry and um, like making them know that that sharing the data and generating that data and then a library of the, that data is, is very important for not only for them for for themselves but for for the others. And the first. Uh, the first step is to know to get that information, and and then probably they feel uh, industry feel that they need to comply with regulation, and they only focus with uh, regulation, and it's different regulation in different countries, and they just want to resolve the like the the regulation that applies to them. And I think that's time to to show that you have leadership, that you relate your production with sustainable practices, also related to water and wastewater. And I think that uh, engaging them and uh, like convincing them that sharing the data and uh, I think that's that's that, that's the way to go. In terms of research, our research, like the researchers' perspective, is that when we look for this BOD data that um, was shown before, we're actually trying to compile that information from Catalonia, uh, from the Catalan Water Agency that is collecting and is giving the permits for industries to discharge to the environment or to wastewater treatment plants, the sewers, let's say. So uh, it's these databases are really difficult to, to understand, to collect, to interpret, to pull together. And then you might have BOD, but don't forget there are other contaminants of concern like the emerging 
the concern the, the contaminants of emerging concern uh, like micro pollutants metals so I mean this need to develop these huge global databases on different types of activities collect that information and try to learn what technologies apply better to each type of industry and then try to find the funding and convince them they need to to invest in 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 the um, in improving technology and discharging less pollutants to the environment. Great, Luis, and we're looking forward to the continued development of the wastewater impact assessment tool to, to really help those collaborations, I think. Um, Matteo, over to you, and you know, as a technology provider, you have industrial partners, you have municipal partners as well, and I'm sure there's some opportunities in that space where you would like to see uh, efforts around collaboration really increase. Yeah, definitely. And uh, in a certain way, I can even echo in the what Luis was mentioning before, you know, there are, he touched several topics, but I would like to say that from technology point, actually, both platform, digital platform, as well as intelligent device, they're already available in the market. So most probably what we need to really change a little bit is a mindset. You know, before I was talking about the skilling uh, in terms of knowledge domain, I think there is, uh, in a certain way, even a, a risk averse approach. Because regulation today is much more perceived as comply with the regulation more than move in a really efficiency production. You know, and that is uh, something where uh, the, the discussion, the cooperation amongst Technology provider, financing, uh, and uh, and definitely even municipality, they are going to play a key role. I underline the, the the key role of the finance in a certain way because, as I say before, uh, unfortunately, the water and the worst water segment uh, has a several cash constraint element. So if we do not combine in a proper way the investment that could be driven both in terms of digital as well as in terms of efficiency, optimization, cost consumption, uh, people, they will only stay and rely on the regulation. And the consequence, again, is regulation is not really driven to poor efficient, to specific efficiency process. Great. Thank you, Matteo. And, and lastly, Nadja, over to you. Um, where would you like to see the energy and the impetus as it relates to industry and investor collaboration on wastewater? Um, yeah, but I uh, still miss a bit in the entire picture is um, the translation of how uh, specific substances in, in wastewater, how they will impact really the situation on the ground. So uh, for when you have a specific substance, it can have a very different effect in one watershed versus another, really depending on what is the cap carrying capacity of that watershed, what are, is the ecosystem that's surrounding it, uh, etc. So I think this translation um, needs to be made. And that's uh, difficult for companies to do. But I think then um, what should happen is, uh, really adopt a catchment uh, approach. So companies within a specific catchment should collaborate um, also with NGOs, also with local uh, regulators to really see what are the needs in that catchment, uh, what uh, impact does our wastewater ha have and how can we uh, restore this uh, catchment or how can we um, change our water discharges in order to, to better manage it. Um, and I think this is really important to, to have really the knowledge, uh, the specific knowledge about the basin. And it, it could be different for every basin a company uh, is operating in. So I think that is where we should still really focus our attention to, to have this localized approach instead of just one general policy um, that, that is for the entire company. Yeah, that's great, Nadja. And it also actually segues into a, qu a question that's just come in on, on Pathable from Anthony Slater. And it, it, it mentions the potential role of, of, of uh, accreditation like AWS standard, for example, which responds, I think, to this sort of local context and basin level engagement. Could you briefly just give an overview of, of how Actium looks at things like the AWS standard? Is that something you proactively look for in terms of um, companies that have adopted the AWS standard? Um, yeah, we do not specifically commit to one specific standard, but in general, uh, what we do when engaging companies is indeed asking them what 
type of standards they commit to and how they uh, they implement their approach. Um, so indeed, that's uh, part of uh, of the picture. We engage with companies, ask them, okay, how uh, is your water strategy, and how do you uh, make the translation towards this uh, this local situ situation. What we are actually thinking of doing, we didn't start it yet, but um, to formulate a clear ambition on wastewater and to then also um, start one of such engagements to focus on one specific catchment, uh, see what companies are active in that catchment and see how we can engage with only this set of companies, how they can collaborate um, and how how we can uh, stimulate further action within one specific catchment. And then of course, uh, standards like, uh, yeah, like that one that it's really, it could be really helpful in, in setting yeah, the scene. Excellent, thank you so much, Nadia. Um, we are just about at time. Uh, so I'd like to thank our speakers, Kate, Graham, Matteo, Luis and uh, Nadia. Uh, in terms of the way forward, as I mentioned um, on Wednesday, WBCSD will be publishing an insight paper that looks uh, at some of the data that Graham presented. And I saw in the pathable chat that Rick has also posted a, a link to that report that, um, that Graham mentioned as well. So look out for WBCSD's paper on Wednesday. We will post it on the pathable platform and um, various social uh, media. We'll also be running this session again on Wednesday. I think it's about um, 9 p.m. European time. So if you've got colleagues um, in the Americas, please do let them know that this session is also taking place on Wednesday. Looking further ahead, uh, we will be announcing the first cohort of wastewater zero commitment companies around the time of the climate COP in November. So again, keep your eyes out for the first companies to make that commitment. And the wastewater impact protocol and the wastewater impact assessment tool will be continuing to be developed and piloted this year. If you are interested in learning more about any of the initiatives we've spoken about today as it relates to Wastewater Zero, please do reach out to us and we'll be happy to have a conversation. Okay, that's about our time up. Um, thank you all for your participation today. I hope you have a wonderful World Water Week and look forward to seeing you at some further sessions as the week progresses. So that's it for now. Uh, thank you and enjoy your next session. Bye, everybody. <clears throat> Hello.